try. We thank you, gracious Heavenly Father, that you are our rock and our benefactor. <coughs> we thank you that you provide for us and protect us. We thank you for all the good things that you have given us and that you will give us for our enjoyment today. We pray for your blessing upon the work we now undertake. Watch over this community, watch over our families, and friends, your church all over the world and have mercy on all people in trouble. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to do a bit of summary on Psalm 92 and then use that psalm to introduce the uh, uh, second map. I guess I'd better put it on. One. Yes, can you always remind me? Thanks, James. I'll appoint you as the watcher. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to do some summary work on uh, imagery and then the importance of structure and function in connection with uh, Psalms, religious poetry. Now, just to uh, uh, summarize what we have done, um, <clears throat> We get a sequence of images, uh, if you like this, four tracks that run through. If you think in terms of a movie picture, um, no, there's shots and then there's changes that occur. So you get one shot and then you get, a thin and you get another focus. Um, uh, you get a sequence of three tracks, three subjects. The main focus is the psalmist, and I should have really put the psalmist first, but I want, um, uh, yeah, that's the way it turns out. Um, you get this, this particular sequence. Um, uh, it starts off, the first picture is the psalmist as a praise singer. Um, the location is the temple. Um, then you get uh, a very, very odd arresting picture, unexpected. This is fairly cliché stuff. Psalmist sing praises of God. Okay, that's cliché. But Psalmist wild bull, you come there and it arrests you and uh, you've got to sit there and meditate on it. In what way? Well, in, how on earth is a Psalmist like a bull of all things and then a wild bull? And then you get the strange juxtaposition of being an anointed person, an anointed king or anointed priest which isn't so far out, you know, given the temple, but Levites, who were the musicians, were never anointed. Now, so doesn't, you know, there's something that doesn't quite fit there if you know your Old Testament. Um, so it could be anointed priest, it could be anointed king, well there's only one king, or maybe the praised singer is then a king, King David. Or king. Um, okay, can you see the uh, questions that arise? And then you get uh, 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 the last picture of the psalmist is the uh, is, is a spectator of of a defeated army. Um, I've got victory there. Um, strictly speaking, it's not true. It's it's the, uh, of of a disappearing army, an army that just dis disappears. Funny picture. Um, okay, that's the one line. Uh, uh, now closely connected with this line is this line. Uh, we, we don't get anything about the righteous, but then the psalm ends with two pictures, not for the psalmist, but the righteous. They are like palm trees, they are like cedars of Lebanon. Now, the question is then, um, at this point, the psalmist disappears. 
And the question arises in our minds, well, are we meant to take that the psalmist is one of which? The righteous. The righteous. And if that's the case, then this picture applies or will apply to him, but notice that's left open, whether that's the case or not. Can you see it? Um, uh, then you get the... Uh, uh, yeah, how am I going? Okay, then you get the series of pictures, the main pictures. There's other ones, so I'm just picking the uh, uh, overall, the dominant ones. There's a picture of God as a uh, profoundly skilled craftsman and a sage, a wise person. He's not only good with his hands, but his hands express what is in his head and uh, uh, um, uh, is very, very ex exercises great wisdom, great skill um, in uh, doing something which is most unexpected and most profound. Now, can I stop here and say, what is God's amazing skill that the psalmist is amazed at? What's the work of his hands? Allowing the enemy to build up and then scatter. Yeah, the way God deals with his enemies. That's the dominant picture, but then there's a sort of a sub-picture too. On the other hand, too, you, God's skill in dealing with who? Righteous people, or his grace in dealing with righteous people. Um, the ones who are threatened by enemies and look like being defeated, and yet where do they end up? in God's house and they end up sharing in God's power, God's life, um, God's kingship. Um, where am I? Okay, we've had, oh, uh, God the craftsman and then God the victor. Now, victor is a, 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 a probably a bad term because um, how is the victory achieved? Disappear. Well, that's from the human point of view. Um, by, uh, death. by death. Not by attacking head on, but just by death. What he gives, if you like, he gives them rope so that they can hang themselves. Um, which touches on one of the most profound teachings of the scriptures, is that God uses evil to undo evil. I don't know if that's new to you. God uses evil to undo evil. Um, so, victor here, it's, the language is martial, uh, 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 military language, but it's military language that's turned on its head. Um, and then you get two very, very strong pictures. Um, there's God, uh, uh, the Lord's house, he's a king in a palace, and that palace is surrounded by a park, a paradise kind of garden uh, with uh, uh, olive trees and cedars. Cedars grow top of mountains. Uh, we had a look at those two. And then the last picture is of God as a rock, a straight rock. There's no faults in it. And then the last uh, line of pictures is... Um, uh, you know, uh, not totally unexpected because the, there's, uh, the cliche contrast is between the wicked um, rasha in Hebrew. A rasha is a, 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 a legal court term. You know, after a trial has taken place, the judge pronounces <laughs> sentence on the person who's been tried. If a person is guilty, he says, Rasha, guilty, wicked, condemned. So wherever you see wicked, it has the idea of guilty, condemned, not by human beings, but condemned by God. On the other hand, the other possibility for uh, God in a court of law, and see there's another picture here of court of law, which is implied. As I said, there's other sub-pictures, if you want to go deeper. Uh, is Sadiq. Uh, 
Now, sadiq, you've learnt when you've done Hebrew, is righteous, but in a court setting, it indicates that a person is innocent, therefore vindicated, justified. Court language, not, not, not uh, king's court, but court of law kind of language. Um, okay, you get the reference to the wicked, and then to the righteous, the contrast. Um, and there's a very strong contrast there. If you take the picture on the one hand, the wicked are like grass, growing quickly, but disappearing as quickly as it grows. On the other hand, you get two slow-growing trees. Which are they? Cedar and palm tree. Cedars which take this big cedars of Lebanon to grow the whole height takes something like a thousand years. Uh, very slow growing, but uh, uh, very beautiful. It's the best timber there is. Um, and then you get the slow gr growing palm tree. Can you see the contrast? Slow growing, quick growing, um, transient, and from human points of view, almost eternal, the contrast. Right. That's your picture. Um, have you got it? Yeah, the spectator thing, I was thinking of um, in Richard III, when you for God's sake, they sit upon the ground and tell the, the tale about the death of kings. Yes. And you had that image there of this removal from the battlefield. Yes, and just looking at it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, interesting to talk about yes. with that image. Yes. Yes. Well, see, there's another image which runs through this, connects with all the way through the scriptures, which begins with the um, Exodus from Egypt. The picture that's used in the book of Exodus is of the ten tribes of Israel as God's ten armies. And God is the general, and you have Pharaoh who is the incarnation of the sun god and all the Egyptian gods with his armies. So you get all the language of uh, uh, holy warfare, God versus uh, the sun god and all the pagan gods. Um, now the funny thing about it is that the 12 tribes of Israel in the key battle at the Red Sea... Leave. What? They leave, they run away. Oh, they run away, but when the battle's finally joined at the Red Sea, who does the fighting? God does. He's an Ish Milchama. He's a champion. He does the fighting by itself. What is the role of the ten armies of Israel? They watch. They uh, see the victory of God. Stand still, God says, and you will see the victory, the deliverance of our God. Stand still, and the idea is drop your hands. Don't, you, know, you don't take up your weapons, just stand, and you will see the victory of our God. That's the same image, and it runs all the way through. Um, and the second way in which the, um, then, then the role of the Israelite armies is, and it starts off much earlier, um, they merely gather the spoils. Uh, the ten plagues are ten battles leading into, remember the final battle at the Red Sea, um, the ten tribes of Israel, Moses, they don't do any fighting, it's God who fights for them. Um, and they merely gather the booty, the spoils of battle. That, that's the same picture. Any questions on that or any further ideas? There is one picture that I left out here, is a picture of God as a person of high status. Remember that? Um, if I wanted to be comprehensive. Now, okay, I want us to go through the uh, psalm again and have a look at the way the psalm is structured. And we'll begin with <coughs> Psalm 92 before we go to Psalm 8. Um, so we're dealing with what's familiar. So can you open your Bibles and, and just, it doesn't matter what translation you have there. Um, now, a, a, a couple of things that you need to take note of when you deal with graffiti on black whiteboards. Uh, 
I don't want it. Oh, you don't want it. I want to get rid of it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> wrong, language. wrong language, wrong topic. Now, um, Hebrew poetry basically works with couplets, uh, parallelism. Remember, it's meant to be sung. And uh, uh, so uh, the poetry works very much the way music works. You have to get certain regularities to fit in with tunes, uh, singing. Uh, I won't go into all the technicalities. There's lots of stuff here that I could tell you about Hebrew poetry, but it's too te technical and it's best to see it quite concretely rather than abstractly. Number one, uh, the basic building block the basic uh, uh, um, workhorse of Hebrew poetry is the couplet. Couplet is two halves of a line which work together. And you have two statements that are parallel to each other. Uh, we'll have a look at them in a minute. You have couplets. Now, that's the expected thing. But um, now, always when you uh, uh, watch poetry, like music, you est establish a certain pattern, and then the uh, surprise comes, the force comes when you do what? Change. You change the pattern. Um, and there are three basic variants to the pattern. Um, uh, uh, the first one is a half. Uh, couplet. Instead of having two lines, you have one line. A very dramatic effect. And then you have uh, the third one is to extend the line to form, instead of having two, a parallelism, but you have a triplet. Um, and uh, uh, then there is a third variant where you don't have two uh, clear couplets, but you have the phenomena which uh, scholars call enjambement. Uh, oh, I'll go wrong. French term, which means you get a carryover. So instead of getting two clear parallels, you get, in effect, just one line in one idea and two halves. Uh, musically, it works as a couplet, but as far as the grammar is concerned, it, it isn't a clear contrast between the two. You have one kind of statement. So um, uh, uh, as you look at Hebrew poetry, you, the first thing you notice is um, the couplets. And then the couplets are joined together by other devices into verses or stanzas. Now a stanza is a group of couplets that are linked together either grammatically in some way or thematically in some way. Thirdly, um, uh, you need to note the connectives or the conjunctions. Which term are you familiar with from Greek and Hebrew? The connective? No, conjunction. Conjunction, okay. Um, uh, that's the term that I use, but a lot of modern grammarians talk about connectives. Uh, the normal Hebrew connective is the wow, the and which works in many different ways than our English and. So you've got to be careful. The and can mean a whole lot of things that it doesn't. But that's a coordinating conjunction. Um, uh, uh, but there's other ones, like the commonest ones are but, a contrast, and for. Now, what does for do? What is a for there for? No, the, the, the but is the contrast. But you, the second thing you say, for gives the explanation 
for what goes beforehand. It could give the reason or the purpose or the circumstances. Usually it's the reason for something. You explain, you know, it's not the main line of your argument, but you're giving the, the, the reason for what you're saying. So watch out for connectives. And then there are other literary devices. Um, the most important of these are repetitions. I won't list them, um, but one are all here, that, because there's a whole host of them, but there's one um, that uh, 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 has become very fashionable, and uh, uh, that's the, uh, uh, an inclusion. Have you come across this at all in your studies thus far? Inclusion, which is a bracketing. Inclusio. Um, it's Latin, inclusio. I don't know why they always use Latin terms. Uh, it's bracketing, or it is enveloping. Now, this is a classical musical term, um, and it's also uh, it's a common device in speaking in oral language. If you're going to preach well, uh, w uh, the, 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 what, where you begin is also where you're going to end the sermon. Hello? That's a classical inclusio, bracketing. You go back to where you started and you round it off. Um, typical musical device. Uh, uh, as well as that, there's a very fashionable one, which is chiasm. You've probably come across this. This is overdone. Uh, <clears throat> okay, now, we have those uh, main devices. Let's now have a look at Psalm 92. And first of all, I want you to... Oh, um, this... Uh, one that I missed. This is very important. A change of subject or a change of address. Say, for example, the psalm could begin... Uh, by talking to God and then ending by to uh, talking about God. Um, okay? Or uh, there's other changes like that. So change of subject, and which brings about a change of focus. That's a transitional um, point. And that indicates a break, establishing a stanza. Now, have a look at Psalm 92, and firstly, can you pick out the basic connectives, conjunctions, and what they relate to? Where is the first significant conjunction? Anybody? Verse 4, and what is it? 4, which gives the reason and content for praise. Now, the question is, how far does that four run? Now, it leads a sequence of verses. Can any of you have a hypothesis as to how far it's, uh, which gives the reason then for what? It's good to praise the Lord, to make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning, your faithfulness at night. Four now gives you the reason and content of the praise. How far does it go? End of verse 7, because you get a transition then, and what's the next connective then? But. Um, it's a contrast. Uh, and the contrast is between what? No, between God and the enemies. Um, the enemies are like grass, but God is on high or exalted. And what's the key word there? Forever. Now, what else strikes you about that uh, verse in the light of what I've said here? 
It's a half line, therefore it's emphatic. Um, and if you'd sing it, it would really hit you in the face because you would stop um, the tune in the middle. Um, okay, where is the next connective? Verse 9, where you get another four. And what does that four, uh, what is it there for? Describes the enemies. It describes the enemies, but how does it, re you know, four always does what? It's, uh, you're, you're telling me what the content of that unit is, <coughs> not the function of the connective, the conjunction. Um, it's an explanation about what? What about God? Bands on verses uh, five to seven. Well, that's what you'd expect, but it, it, it's, it's connected with, but you are exalted forever. Mm. Contrast between the enemies. Okay, you can see it is, uh, uh, it gives the answer, you know, uh, how is, uh, what's the consequence? No, it's not the reason why God is exalted forever, but the consequence. consequence or the circumstances um, that ensue from God being exalted on high forever, exalted over the enemies, therefore what? Therefore this following. Can you see how important these connectives are? Now, um, uh, uh, as far as subject matter is concerned, can you see that verse 9 is, oh no, verse 8 is intrusive. Because uh, verses uh, 6 and 7 deal with the wicked, the evildoers. Likewise, verse 9, 10 and 11. But what happens? Verse 8 is shoved in the middle of the discussion about the enemies. It, it interrupts it. Therefore, unexpected, therefore emphatic, therefore note well. Very important. Can you see the way it works? <laughs> well, except it's only once. <laughs> but Harry, if you, uh, but if you would, uh, if we were singing in chapel and you had to pick the antiphon for this psalm, that would be the antiphon. Yep, you'd run it all the way through. Um, exactly. Now, um, uh, they are the connectives. Now, the last thing that I want you to pick up is uh, the change of the uh, particular transition. Change of address, change of subject. Does any of it occur here and where? Well, it does occur, let me tell you, but where does it occur? To save time. Really, verse 12 it starts to... Okay, now what is the change? Now, identify the transition, the change of focus in verse 12. Verses 1 through to 11, you have who speaking? Me. Me speaking to whom? God. Um, those last verses, you get? God. Well, no. uh, is God addressed? Someone speaking, about. someone speaking, and that someone is, identi is not identified. Um, you get a general statement without the identified subject about God and the righteous. Well, it's basically not so much about God, but about righteous. Um, so, if you wanted to uh, uh, break the psalm up into its basic parts, um, uh, Chris, can you venture a breakdown for me? of the psalm, you know, the basic parts of the psalm in its terms, and we're, un, we're, we're working out now the structure of the psalm. What does structure mean? The, the way it's arranged. Okay, where is the first unit of the psalm? The first stanza, if you like. Have you got it? Okay, anybody? Well, globally, isn't it one to eight? <laughs> well, I... I uh, Bigger f one is one to eight, but then one to um, uh, that one to eight is divided into three parts. There's one to three, four to seven, and 
verse 8. Now, what's the next unit then? 9 through 11. 9 through 11. And what's the last unit? 12 through 15. Uh, uh, 12 through to 15. Through to 15. Um, now, I, there's more that I could say about that, but take notice uh, that uh, how many couplets does that first unit, one to three, consist of? Three couplets, which means six half verses. Okay, the next one? Four. Okay, you go to four there. One is longer. One is so, yes. Uh, so there's four couplets there. Um, and then uh, notice that eight is sticks out again because it's just by itself. The next unit, nine through to eleven, how many couplets? Hmm? How many? Any, did somebody say? Yeah, Hannah, three. Hannah, again, the last <coughs> unit, how many couplets? It's four again. So can you get the pattern? You get three, four, one, three, four. Right? Can you see there's a certain symmetry here? Three, four, one, three, four. Okay, now have you got the basic uh, uh, um, um, so we do the sense of... Hmm? How we do the metrics. Oh, yes. Remember that this is... Sorry. This is... Uh, poetry, this is hymnody, if you like, um, and you need to treat it as hymnody and not as prose. Now, um, the important thing is the structure, okay? If you're going to do an exegesis of it or make sense of it or work out what's going on, you need to identify the way it's arranged. Just as a piece of music, if I can use an analogy, and this is the closest thing, if you want to make sense of a way a piece of music works and what it tr is meant to do, you have a look at the structure. structure. Okay, any questions on that? Yes? The uh, purpose of the extended Verse 7, is that again to bring the last line in 7 and verse 8 together in a clash of emphasis? Uh, it seems to me that the extension, they are doomed to destruction. Yes, sorry, yes, that's, that's right. Uh, uh, you, get, you get, at verse uh, 7, you get a, I was going to point that out, you get a triplet, um, which then, um, now, a triplet extend carries it out, but then the contrast is even stronger. You'd expect to go after a triplet. Brian, what would you expect normally? Well, you, a couplet. Back a couplet, and so it's very dramatic there. Okay? There's lots of other features I could point out here, but I just want the big picture and to give you the basic tools of analysis. Now, uh, have you all got this? Uh, I'm drilling it a bit, but because I, I usually find out that if people have difficulty, it's not the most complex level, but this foundational stuff people have difficulty with, and you overlook the most obvious things. Do you know what the hardest thing to see is not what's furthest from you, but it's what's in front of your very nose. The obvious things are hardest to see. Is that what you see in the translations? Is that right? Sorry. Yes. You don't really see the triplets and the couplets within the... In the Hebrew, it's obvious in the Hebrew. Tra uh, uh, don't trust your translations. Translator, traitor. Um, yeah, and uh, if, if we really want to have a close look at this, there's other features about couplets and triplets uh, and the kind of couplets we have, which you'd have to go to the Hebrew for me to demonstrate. The with, within the couplets, you get a whole huge spectrum of different devices of parallelism. Yes? Yeah, I can see the couplets, no problem, so I'm looking at the Hebrew while we're doing it. But yes. the triplet on verse 7, I couldn't see that, but on verse 1, yes. um, it's a single statement, yes. um, rather than the going straight from the couplet, but yep. verse 1 is yep. different. Yep. 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 We won't go into that, James, although it's interesting because we're not working with the Hebrew and we'll deal with that in due course. Um, now, uh, general uh, 
I wanted to start off with an actual analysis. So one of the difficulties is if you deal with generalizations first, the problem is they stay general. You don't know how to apply them. Now, I want to generalize from what I've done and uh, uh, give you some uh, general instruction on the, the critical analysis of structure. Now, a lot of this doesn't apl just apply to psalms, it applies to any kind of poetry, and a lot of it also applies to prose. Um, the aim of your analysis of structure, now remember the first exercise is the analysis of the imagery, the second uh, formative uh, uh, assignment is the analysis of structure. The aim of your analysis is to discover how the psalm works. Now, uh, here, if I can give you a shift of meaning, probably one of the uh, least helpful aspects of the Enlightenment when it comes to Bible uh, interpretation is that people focus on what a text means. What a text means. Now, the important thing, not just the Psalms, but the whole of the Scriptures, is not what it means, but how it works, what it is meant to do. Um, if you think in terms of a car, um, what does a car mean? <laughs> Stupid question. Uh, because the important thing is, what is, can you use the psalm, oh, not the psalm, the car to do, um, and how it works. Now, if, if you can work out how it works, then you can see what you can do with it. Okay? Uh, in a similar way, uh, if I can get you just to think in terms exegesis of, of Scripture, to start off not with the meaning, but with the, uh, the function, how it works, what it is meant to do. By the way, and once you go there, then it's very easy to preach and it's very easy to use in pastoral care and in spirituality. Uh, you're, you're, you're immediately thinking not in theoretical terms, but in practical terms. And all of you have been uh, 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 trained not to be theoreticians, but practitioners. Okay, how it works. To, do, to work out how a psalm works, you need to work out the structure of the psalm with its main parts and the function of each component. Now we had a look at the psalm as, this psalm as a whole and we had a look at each part. Now the next question is not necessarily what does each part mean or say, but what is it meant to do, what its function is. Um, Right, and then the new idea here is the function as a series of speech acts <coughs> that are meant to accomplish something. One of the most interesting and helpful aspects of modern study of language, modern linguistics and philosophy of language, is uh, that, that uh, ling ling uh, 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 linguists have increasingly moved away from a pure understanding of language as communication of meaning to the way language works. Okay? And uh, there's a whole uh, 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 wonderful uh, uh, lot of work which is very helpful for exegesis and very helpful for preaching and pastoral work, which is called speech act theory. Now, the person who pioneered this is John Austin, um, a philosopher of language in Cambridge who uh, 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 wrote up a series of lectures called How to Do Things with Words. How to Do Things with Words. And if any of you are interested in this, this is the, uh, it's very, very, because it was a radio talk, it's not tech, full of technicalities. Um, but uh, he points out he was the person who first said, look, um, almost every uh, statement we make has three parts to it. There's the locutionary aspect, what it says, and then there is the 
uh, perlocutionary aspect, uh, what it aims to, uh, 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 the effect it aims to have on the hearer. And then there is the illocutionary aspect, what it does by being said. Um, they are technical terms, but uh, I won't go into that, okay? Now, your outline then should summarise how the psalm is arranged, number one, and how each part functions. Not so much what it means, but what, what, how it functions, what it is meant to do. Are you clear on what I mean by function? What it's meant to do. Um, uh, now, I use an imperative and I say to James, could you please go and shut the door? Now, that's a speech act because I say it in order to get James to do something. Uh, okay, not to do. Okay, now, broadly speaking, um, this is just general background and, uh, 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 and I summarize a whole lot of speech act theory stuff. Um, uh, words perform six functions. They can be informative or constative. I give you the term because you know, you'll find coming across. That is, get away from the technical thing, they tell how things are. Uh, proclamation, this is the way it is. Jesus is Lord. Statement of the way things are. Teaching, um, one kind of teaching can be, this is what is. Uh, truth. Secondly, words can be expressive. They can express attitudes, thoughts and feelings of a person or a group of people. Um, so you can complain or confess, admit something, I love you, I hate you. Um, it can, you can an outcry or protest and a thousand and other ways of different forms of what you think what your attitude is, how you feel, expressive use of language. Um, uh, a lot of focus has been on that in uh, modern times. That's your basic hippie mode of communication. <laughs> Thirdly, uh, uh, words can be contractual. They can commit a person or a group of person to someone or to do something. Why is it that blokes find it so hard to say to their girlfriends, I love you. <laughs> because it's not just this, it is this. I don't, a declaration of love is, uh, the words I love you is contractual. It's uh, commissive is another term. It commits you to that. Uh, and as you know, lots of people have commitment phobias. Uh, uh, vows, promises, all those kinds of things are, are commissive contractual terms. Fourthly, they can be imperative. Now, this is not just grammatic, um, uh, 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 it, it, grammar thing with the use of imperative, but you can, you can have statements which are imperatives. You can have questions that are imperative. My wife says, did you put out the garbage? <laughs> Grammatically, it's a question, but as far as uh, speech act theory is concerned, it is a, a very strong imperative. Uh, uh, yes, be laid on me. <laughs> it contracts me. Uh, <laughs> right? Words can ask others to do something or to have something done to them. That's an interesting one. Passive imperatives. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, Jesus says, or Paul says, believe and be baptized. Can you see two imperatives? One is what you do, and be baptized is to have something done to you, to receive something. Um, then you, you get the negative side then of uh, uh, warnings and prohibitions, which are negative uh, uh, imperatives. Uh, what am I? One, two, three, four, five. They can be evocative. They can produce an intended physical or emotional or mental or spiritual state in another person. 
So you flatter somebody so that they will feel good. But there's also a physical side to it. You flatter your wife so that she might be disposed to have sex with you or something like that or give you a nice meal. Uh, uh, <laughs> praise <laughs> praise assurance and one that's very important for the Bible is encouragement, paraclesis. Um, uh, now, this is a whole group of a uh, range of language which is very, very important. And Australians are singularly inept in using this uh, language. You know, the best way we can uh, um, evoke things is in negative form by kidding or putting somebody down. Uh, uh, so you praise somebody by calling them a fool. Yes. <laughs> How are you going, you old bastard? Kind of stuff. <laughs> um, now, the one that's most interesting and most important theologically is that words can be performative, effectual. By saying something, you can do something. Um, uh, take an absolution. What's an absolution? It is this. It's informative. It is evocative because it's meant to assure you that you are forgiven. But most importantly, it actually forgives you. Now, um, can you see the same statement can work in a whole number of ways um, so thank you can be what? Can be a statement of fact. You recognize that some, what somebody has given to you is a gift. But it can also be expressive. You express your gratitude to the person who's given you the gift. Uh, thirdly, it can be evocative because you want to make the person appreciated uh, because they've given the gift. And lastly, it, it actually enacts a thing. It is performative. Can you see the way it works? Um, so don't uh, 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 context will determine which ones of these senses are dominative. So when scholars, when uh, analysts of language, linguists uh, uh, analyze the, what they do, um, uh, it's not as if you put these into boxes, categories, but they talk about the force of particular things. And one of the things about language is that this one word or one statement can do many things. Um, the Lord have mercy is so rich, uh, or the Lord be with you, or uh, good day. I, I defy you to analyze the way good day works, because it, it does so many different things at different levels as a speech act. The important thing is, uh, or say, say for example, hi, or hello. Now can you tell me what hello means? It, and nobody knows what it means. Hi also, ciao. Um, so as far as meaning's concerned, information, it's zilch. And yet everybody knows what? What? Why do we use a word that we don't know the meaning of? Because it performs a function and we know what function it's meant to perform. Uh, it's a greeting particular form of greeting um, uh, and it has a whole range of things here but the most important thing is this. Um, so performative, um, you name a person with a speech act because you give that person that name, um, pronouncing a verdict or a sentence, um, enacts the verdict uh, and the sentence, absolving blessing, giving a benediction. When you give a benediction, you don't just uh, give information, you don't make a wish, you don't just make a wish, but you actually give 
a blessing. What you give what you say. Okay, that's very abstract and general. Any questions on that? Okay, let's have a break now and then uh, uh, I'll apply some and we'll look at Psalm A. Uh, what's it? Six, I wanted to do.